Today, we feature the stunning 3D Arabic sculptures of the supremely talented Iyad Naja. In 2013, Naja established a design firm, IAN, dedicated to the Arabic script and elaborate designs inspired by Middle Eastern culture. He's currently pursuing his postgraduate degree in Islamic art and architecture, which is clearly informing his goals of translating the various styles of Arabic script from ink on paper into three-dimensional functional works of art that play a part in our modern world. I asked Iyad to tell me in a music anecdote that I could share with you all. And apparently Iyad is a food snob. He told me that whenever he goes to the cinema, he cannot stomach the traditional food on offer. Instead, he must bring his own cold cuts, seafood, caviar, and a small bottle of chilled white wine. Sounds good, right? But does Iyad risk getting booted by security for smuggling this in himself? He asks his lady friends to carry all this food of his in their purses for him. Well, Iyad, my suggestion is that you get yourself a bag and do your own <laughs> smuggling from now on. If I were your girlfriend, I would ditch you and eat all that yummy food myself. Okay, without oh further God. ado, let's welcome Iyad Nasha. Hi, guys. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, uh, Grenville, for in uh, introducing me. I'm very happy to be uh, here with you today. Um, and uh, I just learned that this is uh, the first lecture for the summer, it's exciting. So uh, yeah, uh, let's commence. Um, as, uh, as Priscilla, uh, uh, as Grindel, sorry, uh, introduced, I'll be talking about the, uh, the beauty behind the script. Many people want to know why, uh, uh, what's written and what does it say and so on, but, but it, it's all in the, in, the, in the form which contains the word. Calligraphy in Greek simply uh, translates what it means, the beautiful script. And as one of my favorite authors, Sheila Blair, said, Arabic is esteemed not only for its content, but also for its form. Arabic is a script determine the parameters within which calligraphers should, uh, could develop their art, which resulted in uh, appreciated forms for those who could not even read Arabic. Uh, it's self-explanatory. Um, Today, I'll be starting with the how uh, uh, I've managed to uh, uh, take the classical uh, calligraphy, which is uh, ink on paper, into the surface of objects. I mean, I did not do this. Uh, they've always been made uh, throughout history. But uh, in reviving them with a certain, uh, with five specific scripts that I use, and that have given me the chance to, uh, to really uh, juxtaposition all these uh, scripts in a, in a, in a nice uh, three-dimensional way. Then I'll move into calligraphy and design, where we stand and, and how, how, uh, how it is perceived today, and my story and uh, the source of my inspiration. Arabic script emerged from Arabia. Please bear with me. Uh, this is going to be slightly historical, but it's very essential for us to know the, the basics and the foundations and the correct information uh, 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 for, uh, to, to see how this, these uh, uh, scripts, these letters, came to be as we know them today. So it uh, emerged from Arabia and evolved uh, in the context of uh, the Islamic State. And... Uh, before I even start with uh, the essence of the word and, and what words came first and so on, I want to stress the importance of material, what is used to write and what, is, what calligraphy is written on. The, the, the means uh, that, that uh, the material that carries uh, the, the script uh, plays a big role on how the, um, the script will appear 
for example, uh, as we know, uh, the first um, uh, the first kind of writing material which was uh, uh, used for uh, bureaucratic uh, reasons and uh, document documentations and so on is the papyrus. Uh, Iyad, but uh, yes, can I interrupt for one second? Are we? Uh, are you sharing slides yet? Because we're not seeing them. I am. Uh oh, we're not seeing them. Let's try okay. to share. See? Oh, you guys have missed out on so many nice things so far. Uh, okay, good. Now I can see your screen. So let's All right, get can you see? Light. Yeah, and now you just need to, perfect, we got it. All right, so I was just showing a boring map, but then this is what, what I settled on, so it's fine. Uh, I was saying uh, the, the importance of material. The first right, uh, uh, means by which uh, calligraphy was trans uh, transcribed on, other than stone or other elements, uh, which is something that's mobile, is the papyrus paper. But the papyri as a paper source um, was very brittle and it wouldn't last long. We had a problem. You have, here you have a new empire uh, that has had to announce its new fate. Uh, we're talking about the seventh century, but uh, the means by which you want to, to spread the word um, is not feral and uh, it, it doesn't last long and it ages quickly. So, um, uh, and the, the surface of, of the papyrus paper is, is, um, uh, is not smooth. So uh, the write, writing on it had to be very mechanical and squarish. Uh, Quickly, uh, Muslims moved uh, uh, to uh, parchment, uh, which is something the Jews and the Christians have used before, before uh, they came to be. Uh, and they deemed this very um, uh, reliable uh, for uh, religious texts and the Quran. Uh, to make codices uh, in early Islamic times, they would need huge amounts of sheep. And this was very costly. And this would um, uh, take weeks to prepare because you had to skin the sheep, cure it, scrape it, uh, sand it, uh, stretch it, and then leave it to dry for weeks. And then you would write on the part where the hair was, not on the, uh, the, the other part where the flesh was, uh, to, to, uh, to try to get uh, as much of a smooth surface as possible. Um, this was very expensive, so this left no room for um, doodles or scribbles, uh, things that, that a paper would, would allow, and this would give us more insight to, to read more and see, see, see what they thought and how things might have evolved. So, um, and the, the only disadvantage of this, yes, the records were kept and they were uh, transported uh, easily and so on, but uh, uh, forgery was um, was a major uh, issue because you could easily wash off a certain part uh, and and transcribe something else on the uh, on the surface. And uh, you, we have many evidence uh, of of such uh, occurrences. And finally, uh, paper was the last to be used, but uh, was the most common and the cheapest amongst the three in the Islamic lands. It believe, it's believed, rumor has it, we have no proof uh, uh, to have this, this knowledge of paper making to have uh, come from Chinese, a Chinese prisoner during the Battle of Talas uh, in the eighth century. And the, the Arabs took this knowledge and they, um, uh, they were able to, uh, you know, uh, expand it and spread it. Now with, with that, uh, the advantage of paper under the Abbasid dynasty uh, it quickly, it, it quickly replaced, uh, uh, it was as light and as, as cheap as papyrus, but it, it was durable and you can now uh, write um, uh, uh, office uh, work with it and keep it for, for, for a long time. However, um, and forgery was not an option because if you were trying to scrape something off, the paper would uh, reveal that, uh, that action. And, um, but for some reason, 
even though paper was was common uh, in the let's say the eighth century or the ninth century, uh, the Quran only started uh, uh, being transcribed on paper uh, around the um, the late tenth century. Uh, or 11th century, even by Ibn al-Bawab, uh, he um, there was so, so much resistance uh, uh, by by Muslim Orthodox believing that this is the old way to to write it, and we needed to to stick on uh, on parchment. The reason I'm stressing on material is that you you had for the, these centuries you had no room to experiment with with the script because it was so rigid given the surface of the material with paper. Now your hand is um, the hand time on, on the paper is, is swifter, lighter, and guess what happens? The square Kufic-like forms now become more curvy uh, and you start experimenting. It takes color, it takes textures, it takes materials, and you boast uh, your strength. And then competition starts. I mean, if this guy can do this kind of paper, then I, I will do this other kind. I will add this color and I would enhance my, my skills and so on. And also material played a very important role in the, in the writing material, how it was made and what it was made uh, of. Uh, every calligrapher was expected to uh, secure his own paper, prepare his own ink and, uh, and make his own uh, uh, writing pens. It was such an expensive uh, skill that only the elites, creme de la creme, were the ones who were allowed to uh, uh, practice uh, the art of calligraphy. He or she would, uh, would enroll, they would have a, a, a teacher, a muallim, and uh, with the consent of, uh, of, of, a, of a parent or, a, or, or who would pay a, a heavy fine. And you, you ensured security, you, you ensured status, and this uh, pen holder is just like a Rolex now. It's just a, uh, a calligrapher's uh, inkwell, and you know uh, the, the whole kit, just to show off his his strength and his power. He would not use this every day, I mean, but when he had visitors, he would just flaunt it and and use it just to just to, to show you where he's reached in life. So, with this said, uh, now that we know material. Uh, plays a big role in, in the script. And now we've, we've finally settled on paper and, and sky's the limit. We should know a few things about Arabic, uh, the Arabic uh, letter. So Arabic is written uh, and read from right to left. There is no distinction uh, between upper and lower cases as, as in Latin. Uh, shapes of the letters usually vary depending on whether they are in the initial, middle, or the final position of the word. So let's say this letter is, is kaf or k, but it would change if it was in the beginning or in the middle or in the, uh, at the end of the sentence. Uh, punctuation marks were not added until the 20th century, so you had no sense of expression between uh, a question mark or an exclamation mark or a full stop, maybe a full stop. Um, you had like a sort of a rondelles and, uh, and so on uh, in Quranic uh, manuscripts. Short vowels represented by a set of marks below or above the letters aid in the uh, pronunciation of uh, uh, a word. So for example, if we have a B, but with a, with a certain symbol above it, you go ba, and if you have it below, you go B, you know? And you, if you have uh, this form here, you go, uh, Ooh. So it just, it's not so hard as having the actual vowel, but it just sort of enhances it. Uh, now that we know this, let's move uh, to more interesting history. And I'd like to show you this, uh, this uh, sort of graffito. It's the oldest inscription, uh, Islamic inscription uh, till, till date. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's, the, it's called the Zuhair inscription. And it's so interesting because uh, we know we know we know uh, we know of it because it's dated. We don't get much dated manuscripts or sorry inscriptions uh, with Arabic calligraphy, as you can see. 
uh, the, there's no proportions, there's no hierarchy, uh, the words are jammed, it's, uh, it's just like an explosion of words. Uh, for those who speak Arabic or understand Arabic, they know what I mean. Uh, there's no discipline, there's no, um, there's no order. And it says, uh, in the name of God, Bismillah, Anna Zuhair katabt, uh, 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 Anna Zuhair katabt zaman to wafi Amr. I wrote in the, in the rain where Amr, maybe it's Amr Laas, when, when Amr died uh, uh, in the year 24. So 24 would, uh, would mean 6, um, 6, 6, 6, 44, 6, uh, 45 AD. So uh, uh, we have now the first dated manuscript, uh, dated uh, uh, inscription uh, to, to you know, bounce things off. Let's not go to the debate of how it originated. If I told you I, I knew, I'd be lying. But recent studies uh, say the origins of Arabic alphabet can be traced to the writing uh, of the semi-nomadic uh, Nabataean tribes who inhabited southern Syria and Jordan, North Arabia, and the Sinai Peninsula. It's, it's just logical to, to, to assume so, because if you look at the Aramaic, the Aramaic is um, Nabatin is, is the origin of the Arabic language, if not the script. So, so you, you sort of spoke Nabatin, but you don't have to write it. And um, if you trace it, you, you could see, for example, some similarities with the letters. Uh, and this probably took centuries. Uh, and, but we, we, we still don't know. There's many uh, insinuations. It could be Himyari, it could be uh, from Yemen, it could be Nabatin. <clears throat> so this is um, something to uh, investigate further. Now this is very interesting because this is the most uh, important graffiti to survive. Why, why is it important? We have the first recognition of alignment, space, and what I would like to call uh, a design thought. This person who wrote this did not just write it for the sake of writing he 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 thought of balance he thought of separation uh, i mean imagine writing this here uh, on on a on a bent rock and what's interesting is we have these letters there are the lands it's called al tarif it's like the 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 word the it it informs but what he's done he wants to say that this, this sentence does not end here as would be the norm, but continues down there. So he kept the lamb for this, which would have to go with this here. So you know that you should go uh, uh, on the line below and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, I, I, I think it's a very uh, important uh, uh, graffito uh, and it is, uh, it is uh, dated. Uh, given the ruler's time. And uh, it gives us a lot of insight to compare. It's, as you can see now, we're in the seventh century and, and the line is, is angular. It's recalling what we would now know as Kufi. But then uh, when the Islamic empire was starting to take place in the Umayyad empire, it was time to, to do campaigns. These coins are like flyers. The, 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 the caliphs knew that this would circulate worldwide, it's gold. So they took this impeccable, um, they made them impeccable in the sense that they, they, gave, they gave it time and they made every letter, uh, letter uh, legible and clear so that uh, uh, every, the, the announcement that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet is clear to everyone. It's, it, these guys are here new and they're just, you know, trying to, to announce a big event uh, to whomever they can. And, and they were perceived as, as uh, uh, the, um, the chosen ones by God then. And, and, uh, and they had uh, a lot of invasions and they conquered a lot, of, a lot of states and they expanded. So they were sort of on the roll. And this was very imp an important political statement. And calligraphy here played a very important role. And we, we see the, 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 the script has a shape of, a, of, of a, what looks like a Kufi script. Um, and 
we have the the lines are now uh, even the, the the details of of, of the uh, hollows uh, the negative parts and the positive part are, are announced. Simultaneously, during the same time, we the, the script has become so advanced that we can even push it further now and add dots to it. It was without any dots, as you can see, as you can see, sorry, here, it was without any dots. And uh, now we start having dots to, to really, uh, is for uh, vocalization, uh, to, to allow you to know uh, how to announce and to uh, how to pronounce properly. Uh, and then it is placed in the Dome of the Rock, this is Dome of the Rock, on the higher part over the decorative element. And this decor decoration boasts uh, uh, a combination of Sasanian art and uh, Byzantine art, and then calligraphy comes supremely above, and it is way above, it's not really intended to be read so much so as, as a, a band of, of a decorative element. So we have a pure recognition of this script being decorative. And eventually, Kufi, even though later the six pens would come out, explain about them, uh, they would take its place, but Kufi would remain the, the chosen script with, along with a few other, to, to be the, the ones used on architectural facades, and as headers in, in Quranic manuscripts and other, uh, other uh, books. Uh, the, the skill that Kufi offered uh, began to really um, uh, pick up. So we now we have ver variations of scripts. We have floriated Kufi, we have knotted Kufi, we have the new Kufi script, and uh, that's it. It's, it the, the pace is picking up fast. It's, we're, it's, no, it's no longer a matter of... Uh, uh, centuries, we're talking years, just one year after the other, because everything has been facilitated. I ch I, amongst the script that I use for my design, I use five major scripts, not necessarily the ones um, that are part of the six pens, but I will, I will explain about the six pens later, but I use them because uh, they work with me well in my, in my products. Uh, um, I will show you a video now of the Goofy script and how I use it in my designs. Kufi, the first calligraphic script to gain prominence in Qurans and on architecture and portable works of art was the Kufi script in around the late uh, 7th century. It features angular letters, horizontal formats, and thick extended strokes. The earliest surviving copies of the Quran from the 8th to the 10th century were copied in it. Eventually, variations of Kufi scripts emerged. Examples range from letters intertwined with vegetal ornaments known as floriated Kufi, two letters that appear to be woven into knots known as knotted or plated kufi. It went out of general use in about the 12th century, although it continued to be used as a decorative element on architecture, objects, and paper, to contrast with the scripts that superseded it.
Although it is the oldest form of Arabic writing, Kufi's angular form seems to be naturally accommodated with today's modern taste. The letter counts are studied as per the scale and proportions of the desired objects, and a few words are added or omitted for the final result intended. So clearly here, we have the power of form over content. When experimenting with Kufi in my designs, I realize that it gives much room for stylization as long as the negative and the positive spaces are evenly distributed. The beauty of this uh, linear script starts to appear in production. It can carry within its letters long messages such as poetry, phrases, or religious verses, while retaining its pleasant appeal. Kufi thrives the most when contained within geometrical forms of all sorts. The strokes in the stylized Kufi script used in my products are unified by one thickness. For a better visual impact that serves the end result of the product, the lines are then placed in levels of backgrounds and foregrounds. Arabic calligraphy is the quintessential art form of the Islamic civilization. Numerous scripts have emerged over the centuries that serve a multitude of religious, political, social, and cultural functions. Today, Arabic calligraphy, characterized historically by variety and versatility, generates new art forms that transcend ink on paper into a solid functional piece to meet contemporary living standards. Hey, Iyad, you're muted, and we need to see your screen again. Iyad, you're still muted. Do you, do you see my screen now? You're back on and I hear you. Great job. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys see my screen? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, with having seen this video, uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, in, in calligraphy, this is like the invention of the internet, if I may say. Ibn Mukla. Ibn Mukla is a Persian official, uh, the Abbasid Caliph in around the 10th century. This guy, he's the vizier, and he had the, the burden of the whole world on his shoulders. He, uh, he had uh, ambassadors to uh, collect taxes, you know, in, in Baghdad then, it was the capital, and, and he, they, they, they owned a huge vast of lands and, and countries and so on. And, and he would get back correspondences and it would look like the first graffito sculpture that I showed you because uh, someone from Yemen would write in a different way, someone from Andalusia would write in a different way and so on. They all wrote the same alphabets, but the scale was, was, was horrific. I mean, imagine uh, the letter U uh, and with the letter M and and then you'd get another, another country that's sending you the letter M or the letter U. And, and it was just uh, time consuming and time is money. And for any myths that, um, I'm sorry if I may sound uh, very blunt, it, this is where the fine script came. It's not uh, for any other reason more than just for the sake of proper business orientation and faster, uh, more control faster, uh, uh, you know, uh, faster uh, correspondence. So what would happen is he devised the proportion script. The proportion script is all the letters have to be proportioned. There's certain dots to the alif here, to this a, to the mean, to the wow, to, the, to all the letters. And how would that be made? It's made in the proportion uh, by uh, using a rhombic dot in the shape uh, formed when the calligrapher presses his or her pen to a paper in one downward motion, producing the diamond shape. So if I want the same letter uh, in a big scale, I just have to get a big pen, do the same proportion of the dot, and I have the same proportion, elif, and so on. So we had what we call scalability. 
And then what happens is something genius because the whole letters were now canonized. The script was canonized by Ibn Mukla and everyone in all the nations of the Islamic lands wrote one language on one scale. And this really expedited everything. Trade was faster. Uh, art was booming. Calligraphers now were experimenting because they, they, had, they had structure. Uh, you see what we now see as a, a new as a Kufi form with, uh, with, with the canonization of the script. We have this um, sort of, uh, the letters are now set together. Uh, there's little space between the groups, but you can you can read them because the dottings are there, and it it uh, it had this it has this di diagonal uh, uh, feel to it as opposed to the former uh, rectilinear Kufi script used. Uh, so uh, after Ibn Mukla, after Ibn Mukla, then his pupil Ibn Al Bawab, another Persian calligrapher. Uh, what he did was he standardized the uh, he gave them rules the arabic uh, script and uh, he was active uh, till about the early 11th century so ibn al-bawab was also credited uh, for more cursive handwriting which helped standardize the six pens the six pens would now become it's like fonts for example and each one have their own distinct uh, characteristics but in calligraphy we call them scripts and these were generally the most uh, uh, most used in, in transcribing uh, official, official documents or the Holy Quran. The cursive script, uh, also known as uh, cursive Kufi or, or, or the round script, would give birth to this interesting shape here. First, we have this shape. And then when it's now a sort of a header, we have what, what, what appears to be the traces of a thuluth. Now we have another script, which is awesome because it has bold strokes, it's curvy, it's, it's very festive, and it's also used, was used for official documents and decrees and headers along with Kufi for official, for, for books and, and, and uh, the Holy Quran. Uh, the six pens would now clearly uh, uh, have their own uh, platform by another calligrapher uh, in the 13th century called Yaqut al Mustasini. He would clearly distinct them. I mean, one guy canonized them, the other guy, he, uh, he gave them uh, um, rules, and then, and then the third guy. He now separates each and every one. You can distinct, distinctively tell one apart from the other. So you have the thuluth with its subordinate nanesh. You have muhakkak with its subordinate rihani, and you have the tawqiya with with its subordinate ruqa. So uh, one would be like a header, and the other would be like a body copy. Uh, and this is one rare document where the the calligrapher is actually boasting his strength by showing you that I'm a master calligrapher and I am the master of all the six pens. And it was a big deal back then. Thuluth uh, is one of my favorite uh, scripts to use in my designs. Let's have a look at this video. Thuluth, a new system of proportional cursive scripts was codified from the 10th to the 13th century in Baghdad. In a scalable script, each letter shape is determined by a fixed number of rhombic dots, like a diamond shape. A word written in one of the proportional scripts can vary in size, but the letters will always be in strict proportion to one another. There are six proportional scripts known as a six pens, Nastali, Thuluth, Muhakkak, Rihani, Tawqiyah, and Ruqa. Given its bold strokes, it gradually found its place as header to a body of text, or as a decorative element on architectural facades and objects alike.
The Thule script is marked by its clear structure and legibility, which makes it suitable for others and as a decorative element on the facades of architectural monuments. It remains my most reliable script while producing my products. Thuluth and the structure of my products have a perfect balance since Thuluth naturally accommodates itself within geometrical forms. The letter counts are studied as per the scale and the proportions of the desired object and a few words are added or omitted for the outcome needed. So clearly here we have the power of form over content. The Thuluth script paves way for tessellated, which is like condensed words, that are interlaced, weaving a web of words that is ideal for producing structural elements. It can carry within its letters longer messages, such as poetry, phrases, religious verses, while retaining its pleasant appeal. Although it's within the cursive family, it thrives the most when contained within geometrical forms, like a rectangular band or a circular form. The fact that it has bold strokes makes it ideal for production as a solid piece. The letters are interlaced with each other, forming a web of bold words. They are then placed in levels of backgrounds and foregrounds for a three-dimensional effect. Arabic calligraphy is a quintessential art form of the Islamic civilization. Numerous scripts have emerged over the centuries that serve a multitude of religious, political, social and cultural functions. Today, Arabic calligraphy, characterized historically by variety and versatility, generates new art forms that transcend ink on paper into a solid functional piece to meet contemporary living standards. Right, I need to share my screen again, right? That's right, yeah. Here we go. <clears throat> is, it, is it there? Yep. So, uh, now we've seen the Thuluth script, the Muhakkak and its Rihani, the Tawqiyya and Ruqa. What happened in places that were not the central part of, of where, where Islamic, um, uh, where, the, where the capital was? I mean, Baghdad or Egypt uh, uh, during the time later on. They were... Uh, uh, scripts have their own distinct function in, in history. Some were used widely, where others remain uh, local. So you have, for example, in in Maghreb and in Andalusia, uh, it was it was it it got the information later, but it was not in the hub. So something like a hybrid morph, and you have the Maghrebi script, and then this beautiful script called Nastali came to be. Uh, nostalgic, uh, it means the, the, the hanging or the floating script. It's so light that even when writing it on paper, uh, uh, you have to take the time to, to transcribe it because it has its own way. You had to do that. The um, uh, Nostalgic flowing script uh, originated in Iran and Central Asia. Uh, and also spread eastwards, become uh, popular in the Mughal, in Indian, and Ottoman Turkey. Uh, this is an example of Kufi Maghribi on, on paper, and this is a beautiful example of Nastali. Um, it was so much uh, uh, in favor that, it, uh, that the, the uh, the chancery in the, the Diwans and uh, the Ottoman Empire around the uh, 16th century, two centuries later, I mean, Nathalik was, was uh, discovered around the 14th century. So in the 16th century, the Diwans wanted a faster version of Nathalik where they can actually write their, their records and so on. So, so uh, it gave birth, but there is no proof, but studies show that it gave birth to what we call the Diwan script. I will, I will show you uh, another video uh, where I got inspired. Uh, I'll, uh, it takes you from history to my products, uh, both in Diwani, uh, sorry, in uh, Nastalik, 
and then it's uh, what's followed later, the Diwadi. These are again, that would make four, uh, a total of four scripts that I, I, I really love to use in my uh, product designs. Nostalik. Scripts have their own distinct function and history. Some were used widely, while others remained local. One of those was Nostalik or the Hanging Script, which is a flowing script that originated from Persia and Central Asia in the 14th century, then spread eastwards, becoming popular in Mughal and Ottoman empires. Nostalik might have derived from Nasr script, which is part of the six pens, as it developed into a graceful and fluid script. It became widely used for poetry and gained a fondness amongst the Arabs. However, it was not used to transcribe the Holy Quran. Unlike Kufi and Thuluth scripts, Nastaliq would never find its place on architectural facades and not in abundance on objects also. Its joyful and flawless strokes are best posted on paper, especially those bearing narratives and poetry. Integrating Nostalik with my products is only possible when it comes to wall arts that I make, as opposed to my other functional pieces due to its strong presence and motion. To maintain its curves and lightness, this script forms a bundle that can only accommodate two to five words. As much as we try to control the flow of the words within this bundle, it's always best to let the motion of the script guide us into the final form, like a Sufi swirling in a trance. Evidently, we have the power of form over content, and the element of surprise is always worth the anticipation. That effortlessly gives the illusion of rich layers in motion. It can carry within its letters short messages such as poetry, phrases, or endearments with names of its owner. Nostalik thrives the most when it adheres to no frames or boundaries. When working with Nostalik on a wall space, there needs to be enough room to accommodate its curves as not to appear forced. The final tail of the bowl in the descending letters like Noon or Ra, for example, is often extended in anticipation of enclosing the next letter or word, which is nested in the space created. The result is an elegant overlap of letters creating a web of motion that feasts the eyes. For a more enhanced effect, I use substantial amount of depth to the strokes outlines. Arabic calligraphy is a quintessential art form of the Islamic civilization. Numerous scripts have emerged over the centuries that serve a multitude of religious, political, social, and cultural functions. Today, Arabic calligraphy, characterized historically by variety and versatility, generates new art forms that transcend ink on paper into a solid functional piece to meet contemporary living standards. You muted, Iyad. Hello again, guys. So, uh, can you see my screen again? Diwani. The Diwani script was designed and developed solely for the use by the State Department's the Diwans of the Ottoman Empire and for the Ottoman rulers' decree and resolutions in the 16th and 17th centuries. The hanging scripts known in Persian as Nastalik became known in Turkish as Talik, which in turn became known as Diwani, literally belonging to the Chancery. Since the use was restricted to the Chancery, scribes embellished many of the official documents written in Diwani with the Sultan's monogram, known as Thughra, and the design and execution of these emblems became an art form in itself. Being purely a secretarial script, Diwani, unlike Kufi and Thula scripts, was never to be prominent on architectural facades and not used in abundance either on objects. As decorative as it was communicative, Diwani was distinguished by the complexity of the line within the letters and the close juxtapositioning of the letters within the words.
Unlike Nostalik's limitation in words, Dewan gives me the ease of accommodating a number of words on the surface of my products. It acts just like Philoth in that the script is legible and can be either structured within geometrical forms or left floating, and in doing so, it recalls the foundation it shares with Nostalik. The letter counts are studied as per the scale and the proportions of the desired object, and a few words are added or omitted for the desired final result. So clearly here, we have the power of form over content. The Wani script, when used in my designs, creates a complex web of words that are interlaced delicately, enhancing the refinement of the product that it forms. It carries within its letters longer messages, such as poetry, phrases, or religious verses while retaining a general festive lightness to it. The letters race to reach one another with their connections, making it ideal for production work in terms of a solid and connected plane. I usually play the words off of each other in a three-dimensional visual appeal. Arabic calligraphy is a quintessential art form of the Islamic civilization. Numerous scripts have emerged over the centuries that serve a multitude of religious, political, social, and cultural functions. Today, Arabic calligraphy, characterized historically by variety and versatility, generates new art forms that transcend ink on paper into a solid functional piece to meet contemporary living standards. So again, uh, so, so you've seen now, you've gotten an idea of uh, how uh, these, these uh, scripts, uh, the four scripts that uh, have been around for centuries, how they can now be repurposed into, into um, uh, solid, solid forms and they can be pleasing to the eye. They're, they're part of your architecture, they're part of your daily lives. Uh, they're not just um, uh, hanging calligraphy on, on the wall uh, frame. And, and this is the beauty of, of, our, uh, of our culture. We have this wealth of, of knowledge. Uh, the trick is not to take it for granted. It's a, the trick is to repurpose it and see if it can accommodate itself in, in our modern living standards today. This said, I would like to uh, have a sneak peek on uh, calligraphy today, where, we, where, where it is. So uh, it, calligraphy around the 60s, 70s, and 80s of, of uh, the 19, I mean, uh, 20th century uh, uh, went calm because it was the birth of the printing press and uh, it was a new craze and everyone was printing. You can now uh, have 20 posters, 100 posters. You can now, you no need to call a calligrapher to, for your wedding invitations to sit there and, try and, and do the calligraphy for you uh, because we can now do, the, do them in one day. <coughs> so, so what happened is, is the, the remaining calligraphers that, we, uh, that, that had this as a job uh, uh, refrained it within a, within a hobby. And it was starting to die out um, uh, as a business uh, until in the, in the 1990s or early 2000s, the boom uh, of the, um, the Gulf and the rise of the industries and the skyscrapers now wanted, uh, uh, wanted to revive a, a source uh, of, of a sort of a social identity. And guess what? We had uh, a basic, uh, uh, a, a solid I mean, platform, and that is calligraphy. And then calligraphy was once again put uh, on the platform and uh, there was the audience for it. Uh, the first experimentation done during this period was uh, the need to revive the classical calligraphy. And this, this would um, pave way uh, to other forms of art. But now we're talking about the classical callig calligraphy. The first two to do this were the Turks uh, in reviving the Ottoman heritage, followed by the Iranians. I mean, it's not res uh, res uh, uh, respectively, but maybe. And then the Egyptians, and uh, then gen generally the Middle East. Uh, you would end up having people trying to boast their skills by replicating the exact methods by which uh, calligraphy was, was transcribed. So you have something here from the ninth century, 
and something from 2017. Same thing, you have something uh, on, the, on the left, 2017, and something from the 14th century. Uh, you have the Sohra uh, here on the left uh, uh, from 2017, another one from the 1895, and uh, another example from the 13th century, and another from 2019. Same here. You, you see the the uh, the exact effort in in which the calligrapher for them this is uh, an endearment of of the masters. It's not uh, an imitation in the sense, but more of an endearment and a strength and a, a, a of power. We we know the basics. We know our our history. We know the foundations. So. Um, uh, having continued on this approach, there was now this need to uh, to experiment. The category of artists that belong to the to this segment can either be classical calligraphers who wish to explore further, or designers who understand and respect the foundations of Islamic calligraphy uh, and wish to consciously uh, innovate uh, uh, further. This kind of art presents a progressive outlook and a sense of growth and sustainability. Why? Because we have continuity, we have uh, recognition, acknowledgement, and now uh, you, you venture out into exploration and innovation mode, uh, as this video will depict. Contemporary Arabic calligraphy. It is not a new practice for calligraphers or artisans in earlier centuries to have heavily stylized the Arabic script to reach a purely abstract state. Here, the content is subordinate to the form that is either difficult to read or completely illegible. And in both stances, its function is purely aesthetical. Good examples are the anthropomorphic and the zoomorphic styles, which depict calligraphy within human or animal forms. In a way, it's similar to X-ray images that expose the normally invisible skeleton, which is in truth the support of the human body. The Arabic script as a decorative element throughout history is exemplified in many styles, amongst which are the pseudo kufi as seen on ceramic bowls and plates, animated kufi with figure representations acting out the word on metal objects, and as part of the decorative scheme on talismanic objects and garments. The natural beauty of the Arabic script gives us infinite possibilities for experimentation. Presently, we find much modernist and contemporary work that aims at taking calligraphy outside its frame and its rules. When this is done, they fall into two groups that I categorize as the exploration approach and the innovation approach. In my design process, the exploration approach reads the script of its content as a carrier of the word and focuses on the design of the letters and their abstraction as they dissolve within the decoration of the form that they embody. approach absorbs the rules of the six pens in Arabic calligraphy. It is a conscious attempt which aims at innovating a script by breaking its rules or pushing it to its limit. And thus a hybrid script is born.
Clearly, in the exploration phase, the letters are not legible and are usually etched on the surface of my products, giving an accent to the items itself and have no hierarchical value within the decorative scheme. process and with the help of my calligraphy artist we were able to develop a contemporary take on nostalgic that acts as a main structure of my designs. It is more of a three-dimensional relation with my objects. It not only adorns the object but it becomes part of its structure. This approach is very promising for future products that I may design as it gives me the flexibility to appropriate a script whose only purpose is to enhance the structure of my functional art pieces. Arabic calligraphy is a quintessential art form of the Islamic civilization. Numerous scripts have emerged over the centuries that serve a multitude of religious, political, social and cultural functions. Today, Arabic calligraphy, characterized historically by variety and versatility, generates new art forms that transcend ink on paper into a solid functional piece to meet contemporary living standards. Hello again. Can everyone see my screen? We got it, Iyad. So we're going to have uh, to wrap up pretty soon. Yes, exactly. Uh, now that you've seen all my five scripts, uh, just to, before wrapping up, uh, uh, I'd like to show you the third category, uh, which adheres to no rules of calligraphy whatsoever. And these are what I call the high art. They, they basically play on strokes. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're, they're, they're perceived as paintings and they're, they're, they are pleasing to the eye. So in a sense, the inspiration is calligraphy, but there is uh, the rules of Abin Mukla are not there. Uh, the other form of uh, calligraphy, which adheres to no letters, it just forms and thicknesses and th thinnesses of strokes, is a vernac vernacular expression, as we can see here, uh, and on uh, as body art. They, they now have no rules, but they, they recall calligraphy, but they are not calligraphy. 
and this is funny because it says Inta Ma'afin, you're rotten. I don't know if the person who, who actually had this uh, tattooed on their body knew what it meant or it's a prank, but it, it just goes to stress how beautiful the script is. Although this is not a calligraphy script, it's a font script. And you have the commercial aspect where people just take whatever is out there, toss it on a, on a, on a plate, on a box, on a t-shirt, and boom, we make money. And I don't know where to categorize that, but it sells. I don't do that. Uh, the inspiration process, how I get inspired, just to close with this, is you have to have the drive uh, to create, to always be innovative. If you just imitate, uh, you will run out of ideas. And this lady here is the essence of, of my inspiration. She is my theta. And that means Arabic uh, for grandma. And she was an Arabic literature and she spoke with poetry day in, day, day, day out. And she received me with two words every now and then. Uh, and when I lost her, I, to, I took things for granted and I wanted to do these phrases uh, to last forever. Uh, and brass was the best option. And this is how I started. And then people loved what I did and wanted more. And the first one is Talent Idari. It means I've been waiting for too long. That's when I visited every weekend. And the other one is Anarat Binuri Halani Tamarat. It means it's lit and it's now luminous with your presence. So I, I, I picked Thulath for the lamp and Nastaliq for, for the wall art to do that. Um, people who don't know the process of why I do this, uh, for example, they imitate the, the work on my the left is my work and on the right is an imitation. Uh, and they will just continue to wait and imitate. Uh, this gentleman here, for example, um, he, I just woke up one day and I found out that someone's using my image as a, a, a greeting card for, for Eid uh, after Ramadan. And everyone was, was curious and I had to tell him, this is not a Getty image, this is my face and this is my work. So you get, you get this sense of lack of recognition and no research whatsoever. Uh, this entails a lot of uh, uh, research material, a lot of inspiration, a lot of ma uh, material shapes and helps create the edge that the product designer should have. Uh, and it's, it's by constant updating this uh, database that you thrive um, from marble to new cement. This, this is one good example of how I combined concrete with brass and it was a bestseller. Uh, the ideas start from my sketchbook, this is for me and then goes to production, this is for production, and this is for you, uh, the end result. Uh, if it's with calligraphy, then it has to go through a sketch, and then there's some amendments made, then the calligraphic work is made, and then it goes into production, color is set, the result is done, client is happy, more details. So this takes around eight weeks. Uh, this is not a one-man show, it's, it takes three to tango, because if you don't, have a good relationship with your supplier, with the factory, or you have your own workshop, you will end up being imitated as the work on the, the all the works on the right-hand side are an imitation of my work, as you can see here and here. Obviously, this is bothering me so much, I'm repeating the image. And finally, using social media. Social media is something that is, uh, that's a double-edged sword. I uh, not that it is uh, any secret, but my work and platform does not need to be uh, uh, portrayed, uh, uh, does not need to portray my personal interest. What, uh, what added value will it serve? For example, if I do uh, aerial yoga, I don't need to brag about it on my page. And basically, um, this is just a, a, a tip of the iceberg, but when you have the right team that does your work and you keep the tone of voice and the brand positioning all in intact, then uh, this would help sell your ideas. So we have ideas, production, and marketing. They go hand in hand. And I hope uh, this was helpful. Uh, I'm very happy to have been uh, with you guys presenting this. Uh, more to come, hopefully, inshallah. Thank you. Shukran. Yeah, thank you. thank you so much. We um, we so apologies. We went a bit over time, but we do have a few minutes for questions. For those of you who are still with us, I will um, read from the Q and A. And uh, Iyad, let's start with the top one. Remember, people, um, if you have a question, please drop it there. So Susan Mentis asks, 
Papyrus has a long history from Egypt before parchment. Was it used for writing through time as inexpensive compared to parchment? Yes, it was used. Uh, 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 it was like paper, it was affordable, but the only problem with it, uh, it uh, in certain countries with humidity, it did not last long. I mean, in Egypt, it would last long because the weather is dry. But if it, it was in, in the place where it's, where it's humid, it could not last long. And therefore, it was uh, not good to transcribe uh, holy, holy scripts and, and uh, secretarial work, chancery work. So this is why parchment uh, was a good substitute for uh, writing uh, uh, religious uh, documents. Okay, thank you, Iyad. Um, Susan Mentis has really been putting questions in here. She also asked, was bamboo used for pen materials or another reed? Uh, uh, I do not know of bamboo. I know a, a certain kind of reeds, but uh, I wouldn't want to, uh, uh, to say something that I'm not sure of, to be honest. But uh, reeds uh, from around the region were used Bamboo could have been an option, but I'm not sure. Okay, wonderful. Um, then we also have Susan's third question. Do you use traditional tools to make your Kufic designs or only the computer? Interesting question. These hands do not know how to do calligraphy to save their lives. I work with the best calligrapher and the best production managers, but I'm the maestro. They, uh, I mean, I listen to them but they, uh, I conduct, I know the rules of all the scripts inside out. Uh, and I know how to bend those rules and I know how to transcend those rules into three dimensional forms. Because traditional calligraphers don't see it in that way. They see it flat on paper. Uh, it takes your knowledge um, in knowing what the rules are for the script and your knowledge in production to create what I create. That's an interesting point about the, the two dimensions versus the three dimensions, which is what really characterizes your art. We have a question from Ahmad Farin Sadiq, whose name I hope I pronounced correctly. Ahmad wants to know, what are the main challenges during the production? Oh my, oh, I could go on forever. Okay, I'll, I'll, hi Ahmad, uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, you need to work with a reliable source of factory because you see the problems, they don't see the problems. They just want to start production. And you have the, the deadline, especially when you work with very esteemed clients, uh, you have to respect your deadlines. And sometimes uh, we face so much challenges um, in, in deadlines, in material failures. And so we have to sort of do prototypes within the deadline to actually ensure that it would be safe in the client's uh, residence or office or, or the space where it's intended before we actually deliver. Uh, finding the right, really, the right production team is the, is, is the best thing because if you don't have that, your ideas would just be on your sketchbook. Okay. Uh Joanna Cruz Diniz, whose name I also <coughs> hope I pronounced correctly, uh, asks, do you recommend this book for learning how to write Kufic, a handbook of early Arabic Kufic script? Author uh, who's the author? Is Muhammad Vahid Musavi Jazayiri, whose name I'm sure I butchered. I haven't heard of it uh, because I, uh, I, I did not learn it in that sense. I haven't heard of the author. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure it's it's popular. If you want a good reference on everything uh, that has to do with calligraphy and other and, and has a good reference on the source, you may uh, you may check uh, Sheila Blair's uh, Arabic calligraphy. Uh, it's she, she starts uh, from from the basics to present day, uh, and she gives a lot of good referencing also. That's a great tip. Thank you. I've got it written down. I'm answering all the questions, everybody, in the Q&A, so you can refer to these afterwards. Um, let's see. We have a question from Nibal, who asks, what inspires you to create? 
what inspires me to create this is interesting uh basically it's a uh people sometimes need uh external inspiration and then they receive it and they, they project i think i have <laughs> i have so much fuel in me i don't need to uh I mean, research is great. Traveling and being well-rounded is excellent, but it's um, I think it's it's my nostalgia and and my 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 studies and my research. Uh, there's so much fuel in me that I always want to experiment. I'm very curious. It's my curio uh, curiosity. I would say it's my curiosity for sure. Beautiful. Um... Hrant uh, Papazian writes, your work is amazing, truly inspired to see its physicality. Do you know of Rudy Rama, Rama and his work? How do you, how do you spell R -A -H -M -E, that, please? R-A-H-M-E, it's R-U-D-Y-R-A-H-M-E. Uh, no, I will look him up. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will look him up. I'm, I'm interested to always see others. I'm working now on a on a on a really uh, interesting uh, new collection, hopefully to launch sometime in late this year. So I'm very excited uh, to share it with you guys. Okay, can't wait to see that. Um, let's see. We have another question from Ahmad Farin Sadiq. As an expert, which pen do you suggest to start for beginners? like calligraphy start ahmed uh i i'm not a calligrapher and therefore i i don't want to um to jump ahead and suggest something which uh i might i may not be sure of uh i'm a i'm a product designer but i would also recommend sheila blair uh arabic calligraphy because there's a whole title there dedicated to uh, two materials and two uh, 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 equipments used in calligraphy. Uh, uh, this was the pride and joy of every master calligrapher. Uh, I work with the best calligraphers, by the way, but I let each one do their own thing, so I don't intervene much. Wonderful. Okay, Julia Vance asks, how big additions do you make of your objects? Is it an addition of eight or are they like one-offs or? Ah, interesting, interesting. Uh, my philosophy, the idea, uh, I mean, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci once spoke about it in his own way. Idea of limited edition is only, um, is only made to, uh, for marketing reasons. You can only do so much of one thing. If it's that thought of, that uh, uh, concise and th that pricey. Uh, I mean, I can do a hundred. I'm not. I'm not a mass uh, uh, mass production person. I'm bespoke. When you're bespoke, you have to give it, uh, as we calculated, a few three four months. So if I get an order, uh, yes, I can scale up twelve stools in one month. I mean, no, in one, in, in four months. But but then it ends there because you have. You know, you have to move on. So my work is not limited unless I specify it is limited, but my work is certified and it is uh, bespoke and handmade. Okay, let me add handmade. Okay, we got that. Thank you. And then finally, um, I see Hrant has sent you, uh, has sent a link in the Q&A that you can check out of photos. Great. Um, and then that. Hanin Al Kulani asks, "What are the steps that anyone who loves the Arabic calligraphy can take to learn more? Courses, workshops, books, any advice? He wants to develop. Uh, they develop themselves in this field. I, I would say naturally start by by uh, self research and and books, and then once once you uh, once you you know." what is your interest because there's a difference between being a calligrapher and there's a difference between using calligraphy for design you may you may think you like that but it ends up uh, your heart may be in the other so do that research individually and then based on that then you may start looking into courses or lectures and so on that's actually great advice i think that's super interesting that there's a difference between being a calligrapher and incorporating it into design so i think exactly. you're on the head with that one okay 
that's it on our questions everybody thank you so much um iyad Shukran for joining thank us you. and um you so your work is beautiful and everybody please uh check the links for iyad's website um and uh you can check out more of his work on there okay it was truly a pleasure uh, and, Brando, um, thank you so much for for hosting me i'm very happy to be amongst uh your uh your esteemed uh, uh, space. And uh, uh, thank you for giving me this chance, really. Absolutely. And everybody, please tune in and uh, I believe thanks for our next Letterform lecture. Thank you so much. If I want to add that if they want to see more of my work, it's all, all mostly updated on my Instagram uh, page also. OK, links on the chat. Ciao, everybody. Ciao, ciao. Till next time. Adios, guys.